it's an amazing opportunity to be with you guys. I, I've been teaching your youth, you know, every couple of years at the Life Conference for the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years or so. Loved it. And now I've uh, got the honor of speaking to you. I don't know if it's a demotion, if it's a, you know, it, it, it just, but, but when I, I, I heard about uh, the leadership here, I just, I love speaking to pastors. I love speaking to leaders because I, 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 I feel like I've felt so many things that maybe you're currently feeling or have felt, and, and, and especially right now. Um, I, I just feel this new urgency that, 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 that we need to be strong. We need to be united. There's, there's so many crazy things going in the world, and we need the, we need the leaders to, to just be immovable to be stable, and we live in a time where I see so many leaders just fearful, we're, we're, we're afraid, we're scared of making mistakes, and there's just so much pressure on us, so I've looked forward to this time, and I have been praying for you. I've been praying for your strength and for your courage, and I, and I just want to ask you on a scale of 1 to 10, if you, you saw that category, strength and courage, what would you rate yourself right now? I'm just going, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm strong, I'm secure in the Lord, I know who I am right now, and I'm actually really courageous, like I'm, I'm ready to try something, I'm ready to step out in faith. I mean, where are you on that scale? I mean, I'm only, not only, I'm, I'm 47, and I, I just think about life, and I go, gosh, I don't know that life here in this country, and when, as, as it, it's, you know, compared, you know, when, when in talking about Christianity, I don't know that it's ever been so bleak. Um, and yet, I can honestly say, I don't know that I've ever been this confident in my faith. Um, I, I look at where we're headed, and I'm going, gosh, this doesn't look good. And yet, I go, yet, I, I, I don't fear anything. I'm so confident about the future and the future of the church. Um, and I, and I, yeah, I, I hope that's the way you feel too. I mean, I, I just sense this strengthening in the church and, and kind of a blowing away of the chaff and going, okay, what's going to be left here? Are we going to get serious about this? So I'm, I'm very excited about the future of the church, and I'm excited that we, we serve a risen Savior and that He's returning to judge the world and that we will be waiting for Him, anticipating Him, worshiping Him until He returns. And I know that many of you are going to be those who are faithful and standing with him. And uh, so I look forward to it. There's a passage um, that, that's been on my heart the last couple of months. It's 2 Timothy 3, in talking about this world that we live in right now. But it's, it's an interesting passage because he starts off, Paul tells Timothy, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. That phrase, times of difficulty, literally means terrible times. Terrible times are coming in the last days. And then he says this in verse 2, For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. So Paul explains to Timothy, he goes, in the last days, it's going to get really bad. It's going to get terrible. And he goes through this list and he explains why it's going to be so bad. But the thing you need to know about this list is he's not talking about the world. He's not talking about atheists here. 
He's talking about the church. He says why it's going to be so horrible is in the church. You're going to have these people who have the appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. You have these people that, that are, they, they keep learning, they keep learning, but they never come to a knowledge of the truth. And he says, I want you to avoid such people. I mean, Paul makes it clear in the, to the Corinthians, he goes, I'm not talking about the people in the world. He goes, if you're going to disassociate with them, you just have to leave the world. He goes, I'm talking about the ones who call themselves brothers and sisters. And here he's warning, he goes, be careful in the church. There's going to come a time where he says, people, he starts off by saying, people will be lovers of self. The, the crazy thing about this list is many of these things we read, and nowadays we just kind of shrug our shoulders at it. They don't seem like terrible sins, even in the church. Like what you read, like disobedient to parents? <laughs> Big deal. I mean, isn't it more that we are shocked when a child actually obeys his parents? And that's crept into the church. There's an expectation. If you don't believe me, work in the child care. It, it's, it's there. And we just kind of go, man, what can we do? It's just where we live. There's this idea of lovers of self. I, I was reading one commentary that, that said, you know, that phrase, lovers of self, is first because that's kind of the sewage pipe through, through which all the other garbage flows through. He says, you're a lover of self. You love yourself. That's why he says, lovers of self, lovers of money. Why do you love money? Because you love yourself. You want money. It, you know, it, proud. Why are you proud? Because you love yourself. Why are you arrogant? Because you love yourself. Why are you abusive? Because you don't think about what you do to other people. You're thinking about yourself, this idea of self-love which is so normal, so normal in the world today. I, I remember being in junior high or high school and remember that Whitney Houston song came out, the greatest love of all is learning to love yourself. It's the greatest love of all. That's love, when you can learn to love yourself. And yet Paul says, be careful, in the end times it's gonna get crazy because people are gonna love themselves. And even the church, you hear this creeping in, where people go, well, Jesus says love your neighbor as yourself, and so let's focus on loving ourselves more so we can love our neighbors. Because I don't love myself enough, and the truth is, is you go, man, no, you're crazy about yourself. Every time we get together, you want to talk about yourself. Let's talk about me and how I can love me and how you can love me. It, it's just this idea, because you understand in the, and, and it's become so normal to us. I mean, I was reading this thing about these, the sociologists are saying that our culture, this generation is by far, by a long shot, the most narcissistic culture to ever exist. I mean, we think it's normal and acceptable for every single person in our country to create a page talking about themselves. Wanting everyone to look at themselves. Everyone thinking, I have the opinion that's going to change. We think that's normal. It's, it's, you understand back then, they'd be like, you've got to be kidding me. Everyone is going to think that their voice should be heard. And everyone is going to build this shrine to themselves so that everyone else can see and make themselves look as good as possible. It's normal. And Paul says, this is going to get terrible because this is going to be in the church. People are going to be lovers of self, not lovers of God. They're going to love themselves, be arrogant, proud. They'll love money, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, which is the mark of a spirit-filled person as he just thanks God for everything in Christ Jesus. But they're going to become ungrateful, unholy, they're not gonna care about holiness. Let me just say something about that. Okay, when I grew up, we talked a lot about purity and holiness. And lately, there's been a new thing happening, which I, there's part of it that I love. 
Um, and I feel like I'm part of the one that instigated some of this, where I would look at the church and go, man, there's starving people out in the world. There's people with not, no, no clean drinking water. There's, there's girls that are in little children, little boys who are being sold into slavery as sex slaves. We got to get to them. We got to get water to them. We got to get food to them. We got to rescue them from all these places. And, and, and I was just trying to awaken a church, and I saw this younger generation that had this faith and said, I'll jump on a plane right now. I'll jump on a plane right now. I'll risk my life to rescue these kids. I'll risk my life. I'll give everything I have. And I love it. I go, man, that's a great, great passion. I see this fire and I see this faith. But that same generation, I also see that they've walked away from holiness and were willing to go and take steps of faith. But are we willing to keep our bodies pure? and our minds pure? Are we still concerned about being morally pure in the eyes of God? You're gonna be heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Again, how many times are we seeing it now, even in the church, where we're trying to draw people into the church through pleasure? Come on, if you, if you follow God, he'll, 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 he'll make you rich. He'll get everyone healthy. You'll have your family back. Don't you want God? And, and it's all about you, and it's all about pleasure. And, and they're like, okay, let me try that. If that's going to restore my marriage, if that's going to make my kids love me, if that's going to take away my sickness, if that's going to help me get a job, if that's going to make me rich. And you've got this gospel being preached out there saying, if you follow Jesus, you will get this. Rather than, no, if you follow Jesus, you'll get Jesus. And that's, that, that's enough, that's enough. He'll be your shepherd and you, you won't even want, it'll be like your cup is overflowing. And, and, but, but he says, no, in the end times, they're gonna be lovers of pleasure, not lovers of self. And so I've been praying, going, God, I, I don't wanna be like oh, the, the end is near kind of guy, but I look at the world and I look at where we're at and I look at the church and I go, gosh, now is the time for us to be strong and go, okay, that's fine. That's going to happen, but not me. That's why I love when, you know, when Paul would tell Timothy things and say, the world's going to get this way, but as for you, but as for you, man of God, not you, not you. Okay, this is what's going to happen in the future, but you, here's what I want from you. And that's what I was praying for in this, in this room. I'm going, God, I just want them to be strong. I want them to be strong. You know, the world's getting crazy. Who knows what's going to happen next? You just see it happening. The writing's on the wall. Every, every month seems like just something new that goes against this book. And it's like, I don't know if this can be stopped. And so I'm praying for you while I was flying here today. I'm on the airplane, you know, and I'm, I'm on, you know, not on my knees. I would have been a little weird. It's just too tight with the aisles. And I'm, I'm just, you know, on my face like this, kind of praying, God, come on, you know, help me. Help me. You know, and I, you know, I take a break and I would look and, you know, you got the TV screens going on and, and I'm praying. And every time I peek up that, that show, uh, The Deadliest Catch was on. You know that? That's about people who go to the Bering Sea and try to catch a crab and, and, and die. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm praying and I'm looking, you know, at the, the TV every once in a while, you know, praying some more, looking up, watching, okay, how many did they catch? And, and, but it, 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 there was this picture, I'm not trying to exegete Deadliest Catch, but it, there was just this thought of, man, our job, sometimes we as believers will look at the world and all the stuff that's going on and we try to change that. And I just don't know if that's what I see in here. It seems like there, is some, there are some things that are inevitable of where our world is going to go. And our job is not to calm the sea, but to, to make sure our boat is intact. 
you know, and make sure it keeps heading in the right direction. And make sure that crew is strong and courageous and we just keep going and keep steadying the course because we're not going to be able to affect the whole world in that sense. But we're responsible for the church. We're responsible for our boat. And I just kept looking at these, these boats being ta turned and tossed by the, the ocean. It's like, man, it wasn't their job to try to calm the seas. They can't do that. But the boat, they had control over that. The crew, they had control over that. And it was just this picture in my mind as I was reading 2 Timothy going, man, that's what he's saying here. Is okay, this is going to happen, but you, the church, what are you going to do amidst that? Are you going to stay the course? Are you going to keep these people encouraged and focused and go, no, we're heading somewhere. I know right now it feels like we're going backwards. The storm's coming right at us and we're turning left, right, everything else. People are getting thrown over, but let's, let's just keep this thing going because it's going to happen. We've we got to keep going in this direction. See, this is about the church. I think a lot of times we need to pay less attention to the world and more attention to the church. That's what Paul was saying, right, in 1 Corinthians 5. It's like, I'm not asking you to judge the outsiders, but I am asking you to judge the church, to judge those who are inside. That's what we're called to do. And, and the first place we have to look at is, is us, right? We've got to start with ourselves. Are you personally deeply in love with Jesus right now? Are you secure, strong, courageous? Oh God, I, I love you. I see where this world is going. I'm not going with it. I'll, I'll, I'll go against the flow because I love you. Are you still in love with your people? During this council, we're talking about being this family. But I've made many mistakes in ministry by assuming. Assuming that couple's doing fine. I mean, haven't there been so many times where you have dinner with a couple and you, you know, you do, you know, you have a good time, whatever, and then you find out like a week later, two weeks later, that they're ready to leave each other, and you're like, what? I just assumed everything was fine. They seem fine, and, and, and you, you, you just want to kick yourself like, oh, I should have seen this, I should have seen this, I should have seen this. I just assumed they were fine because they're on staff. I assumed they were fine. He's an elder. I, mean, I assumed he was fine. He went to Bible college. I assumed this, I assumed that. And so it's very easy for me to walk in this room and go, man, I'm just going to assume they all love their people. And they love being shepherds. They love the people they lead. And that would be such a foolish assumption. Man, having spent most of my life in ministry, there were many seasons where I can't say that I loved the people I ministered to. That's, that's why I, John was asking me, he goes, how do you prepare before you speak? And I said, I've got a series of seven questions that I ask myself, but the second question I ask is, do I really love these people? Because there are many times when I've walked on a stage and I didn't love the people. I was just getting the message across. But I, I didn't look in their eyes and think, okay, if I really loved her, if I really loved him, what would I say? What, what would I really say that's going to matter a hundred years from now? That's going to matter when he stands before God. Man, what can I say, God? I, I care about him. I care about these people. I don't want them to just keep doing this and this and going through the routine and then standing before you. If their hearts were gone and they were just speaking with their lips and just, you know, working a job and taking a salary and just you know, going on with tradition, 
rather than, man, igniting their hearts again and, 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 and not forsaking their first love. It's, it's like, okay, God, help me. Help me to love them. And even right now as I'm looking at you, I'm going, God, help me to really care, to really believe I'm doing something up here and trying to use whatever spiritual gift I have to bless you so that maybe a hundred years from now when you look me in the eyes, you can say, man, I remember what you said that day. It had an impact on me. It got me thinking, do I still believe that God that I first believed in when I was young? Because I remember being young. I remember walking out of Sunday school and believing in the story of David and Goliath and walking around going, no, I can do anything. I can do anything. I remember as a young, young minister just you know, walking around, maybe knocking on doors, just believing that God was going to do something. To, and, and then slowly, board meetings happened. You know, and budgets happened and everything else. And it's like, Lord, is there anything I can do to get them back to you, alone with you, where no one else is around? It's just you and this book. And you're going, okay, God, that's what it says in the last days. Okay, even if it's you and me, even if none go with me, I'm going to follow you because I love you, Jesus. Like, when's the last time you had a moment like that? Where's just you adoring God? And saying, Lord, I, I'm going to obey this. And then to stand in front of your people, having met with him, and then coming to the presence of it. Because you're a lover of God. Not a lover of pleasure. Not just a lover of ministry. Not a lover of success. Not a lover of when the room is full of people. Not a lover of when the budget is, is met and exceeds. You know, Not a lover of a good offering that week. But just a lover of God where it's like, I adore him, and I'll say whatever I need to say, because he tells Timothy, look, in the last days, a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Where he goes, Timothy, there's going to be a time when no one puts up with this but you. As for you, let them go. They're going to go and, and, and they're going to just find a teacher to tell them what they want to hear. Why? Because they're a lover of pleasure. If they want to get divorced, they'll find someone with a PhD to tell them it's okay to divorce. If they want to have sex outside of marriage, they'll find someone with a PhD to explain to them, oh, no, no, this is okay. If they want to be greedy and spend all the money on themselves and neglect this mission to reach the unreached around the world, they'll find someone with a PhD to explain to them why it's okay for us to just sit and bask in all of his blessings. We'll just find someone to tell us whatever we want to hear. You want to abort your child? You want to marry someone of the same sex? I'll, I'll, I'll find you a teacher, Christian, PhD. I'll tell you it's fine. You want to stop believing in hell? I'll find you someone. The PhD will tell you that. You want to just believe that there's no punishment, that God's a God of love and only love, and there's no wrath, there's no judgment to come? There's plenty of books about that. What, what do you want to believe? What's your pleasure? What, what would you like? I'll find you a teacher to give you that. But Paul tells Timothy, don't you be one of those guys. You know what this book says. You preach it. You lay it out there. Now's the time to stay the course. Now this time is to stay strong because the time's coming. People are going to be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure, not lovers of God. Do you love your staff right now? I had times when I really loved my staff. I mean, really, like every one of them where I thought, I would take a bullet for everyone on staff right now. And there have been other times <laughs> where I'd like to put a bullet. No, no, I, I, no, I'm kidding. But, you know, there are those times. But, but again, we, first of all, we got to go, okay, because sometimes we go, oh, my church is this way, the world is this way. But first, we got to look at ourselves we got to look at the leadership and go, okay, what are we modeling here? 
Am I a man or woman who just gets on his or her face and adores God, gets alone with this word, gets convicted and says, no, I will preach this, I will lay it out. Because again, we're living in a time where I'm seeing some of these younger believers, they're excited, they're doing crazy things, they're living by faith, I love that, but what they're unwilling to do is preach truth. See, it used to be that there was a lot of preaching of the gospel, and yet it seemed like, why don't you care for the poor? Why don't you care for the needs of the earth? And it wasn't a popular thing, but now it's very popular to go care for the needs of the world. You're never gonna get attacked for drilling wells overseas, but you'll get attacked for preaching the morality in this book. You'll get attacked by saying there's only one way to heaven, it's through Jesus Christ. And you'll get attacked for saying that there's a narrow road and few will find it, and yet there's a wide, easy road that leads to destruction. And so a lot of times we'll run to the things that are popular. But where are we? Where are we today? Are we strong? How's your staff? Are you in love with them? Because Jesus says something really interesting. Um, he says a lot of really interesting things. But... Uh, um, the, the passage I was really wanting to focus on was, uh, you know, it was in John. And John, that, that last time that Jesus had with his disciples, you know, in John 13 and 14, when they're, they're a little afraid because Jesus tells them that he's leaving. And he says, don't be afraid. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. This is to your advantage. It's, it's going to get really good. It's going to actually get better than me being here, which is an amazing thought, Right? I mean, the thought of Jesus. What if we said, hey, Francis isn't going to be here. Jesus is going to come and speak. Please tell me you'd be excited about that, you know? But there is a truth in Scripture in which there's this advantage of the Holy Spirit that we've really got to start to believe. That could it be that a man filled with the Holy Spirit would be able to do greater things than what Jesus did according to John 14, 12? I mean, do we really believe that? Do you believe that about yourself, the words of Christ? And so Jesus was saying, hey, don't be afraid. I'm going to send another counselor. It's actually going to be better for you. It's better than me being on the earth. Then he goes on. And, yeah, I mean, this is the group. This is his disciples. And he's telling them, you're going to get the message to the ends of the world. I'm going to be gone, but you're going to pull it off. And he, he goes, don't be afraid, though. He goes, just abide in me. Just abide in me, and you're going to bear a bunch of fruit. Okay? Don't be afraid. Don't look at your mission and go, how are we, the 11 of us, are going to get the message to the ends of the earth? Don't worry about it. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and you just abide in me. Abide in me, and I in you. Apart from me, you'll do nothing, but you just abide in me. Ask whatever you wish. Okay? We're, we're, this is going to get done. You just must keep abiding in me. Don't start running to all these different methodologies, freaking out because you don't have enough people in the room and run to something. No, abide in me. Trust in the Holy Spirit. But then when he's done giving this discourse, he prays in John 17, a passage that we're, we're all pretty familiar with. But he says some things in John 17 that really tested my faith. Or I go, ooh, do I really believe that? And if I really believe that, then what would I do? There, there were really two phrases in John 17 that I go, ooh, I don't know that I ever noticed that, and I don't know if I totally believe that. In Jesus' prayer in John 17, he says in verse 18, he says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, 
and love them even as you have loved me. The phrase that occurs over and over in that passage, one of them that I'm having a hard time with is just as. Just as or even as. Where in verse 21 he says, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Okay, I always knew John 17 was about unity. And I always knew that he wanted us to get along. And he didn't like the bickering, he didn't like this or that. But this phrase, are you seeing what he's saying? He goes, just as. What was, his, what was the prayer of Jesus? His prayer was, Father, may they be one just as. I'm in you and you are in me. Think about that. He's not just saying, I want them to get along. He's not saying, I just want them to be able to, maybe it could just be one denomination in the whole world. I, that's not the, he goes, no, I want something even more than that. I'm praying for something even deeper than that. I want them to be one, Father, like you and I are one. Okay, how close do you think the Father and Son are to each other? And that's why that phrase, just as? Okay, like, like what's your name? J Jonathan, oh, I was going to ask him, sorry. Greg? Yeah, I don't, I don't care about you. Greg. So, I get, okay, I don't know Greg. I met you earlier, so it doesn't count. Okay, so I, I don't know Greg, and... I'm assuming, because I have the Holy Spirit in me, that I could put up with you, okay? And you could probably put up with me, and we can worship together, maybe even be in a small group together, you know, for maybe six months or so. You know, like, I can assume, like, that's what I think when I think of John 17, unity. But I don't think, God, you prayed that Greg and I would be one, like you and the Father are one, just as you and the Father are one. See, I never had that picture when I was shepherding my congregation down here in Southern California. I wanted them all in a room. I wanted us to get along. I want to quit the bickering over stupid things. But did I have as a goal, God, I'm going to get as close to Greg, and I want to have this oneness that the Father and Son have. I, I, I don't know that I ever even believed that was possible. See, but these are the things that are possible through the Holy Spirit. That there would be this oneness that we would have. And this oneness just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 23, I and them and you and me that they may become perfectly one. Perfectly one. I and them, you and me, that they may be perfectly one. And God's included in that. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's like this triangle. It's just like they're connected to each other. They're connected to us. We're just one. All I and them, you and me, may they be brought to complete unity. Perfectly one. But here's the other phrase, that they may become perfectly one. Here's the phrase, so that. Verse 23, so that. What? So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. So that. He's saying, this Jesus, why did Jesus pray for this perfect unity between me and Greg and everyone else in this room and everyone you call a brother? Perfect, like father, son type of unity. He says, so that the world may believe that you've sent me and that you love them even as you loved me. Okay, you talk about a wrestle. I, I look at that passage and I go, that does not make sense. Why would our unity cause the world to believe that Jesus is the Messiah? 
I mean, honestly, it doesn't make sense to me. It, it really doesn't. I don't, I don't get it logically. Where I go, gosh, I, and my mind, you know, just more mathematic. I just go, gosh, that doesn't seem to add, you know, I'm Asian. It's just like, oh, two plus two. It's just, wait, because when I think, how am I going to get the world to believe? How am I going to get the world to believe that Jesus is the Messiah? I would think it's through apologetics. I think it'd be through explaining the prophecies in the Old Testament, how Jesus was the fulfillment of that. I would think that maybe it's even through miracles. Like, okay, God, have me levitate right now. That'll get him believing. And yet what Jesus in his prayer is saying, Father, no, you make them one so that the world may believe that you sent me and that you love them even as you have loved me. See, again, this doesn't make sense. I go, God, that, I don't see how that will do it. But that's where we go, do you trust this book or not? It's like saying, God, I don't get, why would we march around the city seven times and blow a trumpet? Just, just do it. Just do it, it'll work. And it's that same type of thing. I'm going, God, I don't get it. I think if we do these services where, you know, you got like, maybe if we get like pro athletes, you know, to give their testimony. And, and maybe if some famous, you know, actors or actresses get on that stage, then it'll, if Beyonce, you, you know, if you start going, like if this happened or this happened, our logic tells us this. But at some point we go, are we going to believe the word of God or not? Where he says, no, we've got to look at ourselves, look at the church, look at our boat. And go, okay, are we unified? Are we one as the Father and the Son are one? Because if so, then the world's going to start believing. I, I love how um, Paul says it in uh, Philippians. I think it's Philippians 1. Um, this is crazy. Philippians 1, verse 27 only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. <laughs> That's even crazier. Paul says, no, if, if you guys would strive side by side, not frightened in anything by your opponents, he says, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction. What? No one believes in their destruction out there. They don't believe there's a judgment. Man, half the people in the church don't even believe a judgment's coming. Which I just go, man, do you ever read this? Like you go, well, I don't believe a loving God could judge. I go, get to page two. <laughs> it killed everyone. <laughs> it's like, what are you thinking? And they're like, well, you know, and I'm like, man, read about Egypt, read about, you, you know. I mean, the ground's opening up, it's swallowing up people. You tell me, man, you, do you read? And they're like, well, oh, you're just quoting Old Testament. Yeah, because he mellows out in Revelation. <laughs> you just... <laughs> you guys... <laughs> but what the Bible says, though, is it's our unity. When we're perfectly one and we're striving side by side, the Bible says they're going to start believing in their destruction and our salvation. Again, this doesn't add up to me. But I made a decision that even when this book doesn't make sense to me, I'm still going to submit to it. And whenever I disagree with this book, I assume I'm wrong. Okay? This is a big problem in our world today, is whenever your brilliant mind disagrees with this book, you assume there's something wrong here, rather than something wrong here. 
Okay, and this is what God is saying. He says, look, I know you have your new methodologies. I've read all the books, but I'm telling you, when you become one, like the Father and Son are one, when you become perfectly united, not afraid of anything, they're going to believe in their destruction. They're going to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and they're going to believe that you were loved by God and that you are saved, and that's what Scripture teaches. And so our work this week is to say, you know what, I know I pretty much get along with these people, but am I pursuing this oneness? The Bible puts it this way in 1 Peter. I love this passage. 1 Peter 2, verse 4 and 5, it says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. He says, you're like a, a living stone being built into a spiritual house. Do you ever think of yourself like that? That you're a piece of the temple. You know, a lot of times when we, we, we talk about the temple of God, we say, well, in the New Testament, I'm the temple of God. Yeah, there's truth to that. But usually when it talks about the temple in the New Testament, it's not you singular. It's usually you plural. Like in, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? It, it's not you individually there. That's the plural word for you, that, that the, the singular temple dwells in the plural you. Like, like the y'all. I mean, really, that's what it's saying. Do y'all not know that y'all are God's temple singular and that God's spirit dwells in y'all, all y'all. And if it, it's this idea of, of, of the same thing in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 5, is, 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 is I'm a part of that temple. And yes, there's other parts that talk about how we singularly do are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, he's in me, but there's an even more real picture here of us being stacked up. And I don't know if you ever thought of yourself that way. But until I studied that path, I didn't really think about it. It's, it's, it's like in my pocket, I have this. I don't know if you can see it. Um, yeah, let me see. I'll put it by my shirt so it contrasts. It's a little Lego piece. See that? Okay. This is what I've done for so much of my life. I wanted to just stand out by myself and go, look at me. Look at me. If you look closely, man, my edges are probably a little sharper than most of the Legos. These little round pieces are even a little, little rounder. And, and man, it's just, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And I'm off by myself trying to draw attention to myself. But who wants to look at one Lego piece? Right? And I never thought of myself as, man, what's the purpose of this? The purpose was to be a part of something bigger. Right? told my son, build me a temple, and this is what he came up with. Um, but the idea is, you know, as 1 Peter 2 is talking about how you're one stone, and you, you just attach yourself, and, 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 and maybe we want the position of prominence, you know, and, and at different points in our life, it's like, okay, okay, I'll attach myself to everyone else, but I want to be right here. I want to be the guy out front. I want to be the one that everyone sees. Rather than just saying, man, no, it's just an honor to be a part of the temple. Because why? Because Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of that temple, according to Ephesians 2, and it's built on this foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And to think, I can join Jeremiah, I can join Paul, I can be stacked into this temple. Man, I can join with Peter, and I can be another piece of this thing and then we can join together. Wait, uh, this week it's like, oh, I can jump in with the Alliance Church. I can, I can be stacked there right next to John this week, and together, man, we can become this temple. And I don't know if you remember that story in 2 Chronicles 7 when the temple was finally built and fire comes down into the temple and the glory of the Lord fills the temple and everyone's outside on their faces. No one dares walk in. That's why I want to be a part of the temple, 
because these are the people who get to see the glory of God and get to see the fire come down. Okay, the people that are off here going, look at me, look at me, look at me, they're not going to see. It's like, no, I want to be a part of this. I want to know that I'm attached to the same thing that Peter and Paul were attached to and Mary, and I'm just another block in there. And I don't care. I don't care if I'm in the back here. No one ever sees me because the idea is I want to see the glory of God. I want to get a picture of this because, man, I, I hope that's you. I think we all read Acts chapter 2 and there's part of us that longs for the, the end part where it talks about how people didn't have any need. Everyone was looking out for each other. And you read that and go, oh, I wish I lived back then. Man, I, I wish I could have been a part of that church. But you guys, in that unity, what happened in that upper room when those apostles were praying together? Because remember, the Old Testament temple isn't here anymore, right? We just talked about that. Who's the temple? Where the temple? So where was the temple on that day? It was in that upper room. And what happened in that upper room? Fire came down, didn't it? And filled what? The temple. The, the, this unified temple. And I'm going, God, I want to be a part of that. Don't you read the, the, the Old Testament, New Testament, you see the miracles and you go, God, I just want to see one of these during my lifetime. Just one of these. And I just think if we keep striving after these man-made strategies, go, maybe if we do this, maybe if we do this, maybe if we try this, I don't think we're going to see the glory of God. God. God had a plan for the church. He says, I want you to be so in love with each other, so unified. And when you're one, the world's going to believe. They're even going to believe in their own destruction and your salvation. But you've got to stick together and strive side by side, not afraid of anything. You all become the temple of God. And that's my prayer for us. I don't know. I honestly, I don't have any answers as to how are we going to get all these denominations to be one? How are we going to get all these people who I've seen with the Holy Spirit in them to become one in a way that's visible? And I, say, I have no clue. I just know I've got to start with me and start with whoever's in front of me. And I, my mind can't figure out the whole big picture. I just go, I know it can happen because Jesus prayed for it. So right now, at least with my leaders, let me start even in my own home and with my leaders and with my staff to say, look, we got to be perfectly one. Let's pursue this oneness that Jesus calls for. And then let's just see what happens to the church after that. If we can become that type of unity, let's just trust the Lord will bring the increase in every other area. But let's just be that family for now and strive for that. So I, I, I want to pray for you right now. I, I want to pray for this time. I don't, see, I, honestly, I don't know a lot about your denomination specifically. <clears throat> I've been with the students a lot, but I've been with students in a lot of different denominations, and I, each group has their particular issues, and I don't know what any of them are, and I just tend to really like people, depend, you know, it's like, okay, he's a little more charismatic, he's a little more concerned, I don't know, I like him, I like him, you know, it's just, I, I get that, but I don't know what's going on in this room, I don't just assume that you love each other and are crazy about each other. But my prayer is that the miracle would happen and that we wouldn't just get along this week, but there'd be a deep love, a Holy Spirit love. So I'll close with this and then I'll pray. I mean, honestly, when's the last time you were gathered with a group of believers and there was such a supernatural bond between all of you that if an unbeliever walked in, he or she would have went, no way. I've never seen people love like that, forgive like that. Because the Bible says that's what's supposed to attract the world. 
not a great speaker, not a great band, not a great kids program, not famous people giving their testimonies. It was they were supposed to walk in and go, I've never seen unity like this. And this is what drove me crazy in my church at one point. I realized I wasn't after that from the start. I just wanted to preach the word and get people in a room. I never cared that they really loved each other. Then the more I studied the word, I go, wait a second, I did this all wrong. You guys are supposed to love each other and that's what's supposed to attract the world. But then when I tried to change and turn the ship and get people to actually even spend time with one another, man, you'd think I was Satan. You know, the response is like, it, it was crazy. The church is not known for its love. When's the last time you were amongst a group of people and an unbeliever would walk in and go, no way. That's what God wants of his church. And so I want to pray for that. But that type of love here amidst the leadership, it starts with us. Where someone would walk in one of our circles and go, I can't believe what you sacrificed for each other. I've never seen that kind of unity. And in your heart, do you still believe this can happen? Just as the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father, do you believe that type of unity could take place in this room through the power of the Holy Spirit? Let's fight for that. Let's keep believing in that. Let's stay the course. Okay? We can't control the waves. Let's just get our boat right. Let's keep our people together, motivated, strengthened, united, and courageous. Let's pray. Father, we didn't come into ministry to run a church. God, I believe we entered into ministry because we wanted to experience you and your supernatural power. We read the miracles in the Old Testament and the New, and we go, we want a piece of that. We see pictures of the way the church was at one point. And God, we wanted to believe in that, Lord. And some of us are just beaten down, Lord. And some of us are even angry at our own staff and elders. And even our own children. And God, you want perfect unity, Lord. It's going to take a miracle from you. It's something your Holy Spirit can do, Lord. Jesus prayed for it, so I believe it can happen. And help us, show us what the next step is for each of us individually. How do we become a more loving staff? How do we become a more loving church to where the world would look in, see our unity and courage, and believe that Jesus is the Messiah who died on the cross for our sins, who rose again, and is coming back to judge the world. God, help us in this room not to be lovers of self or lovers of pleasure, but lovers of you. Father, destroy the pride in this room of those of us who have sought to make a name for ourselves rather than just wanting to be a part of the temple so that your glory would be seen. Father, I thank you so much for the Christian Missionary Alliance. I thank you for our brothers and sisters who've gone after your great commission and are going to the ends of the earth telling people how wonderful you are. And I just pray that you would protect them. Protect them of isolation, pride, disunity. And God, this week, I pray that you repair any broken relationships in this room, 
and the leadership. And I pray that we would not just get along, but by the power of your all-powerful Holy Spirit, that we would be one just as you and your Son are one. Please unite your church, Lord, and take away all fear. In the powerful, matchless name of Jesus Christ, the greatest name on earth, there's no other name by which we can be saved. In his name we pray. Amen.